Come now, let's look at it from the opposite perspective, from what is our role in all of this. Jesus, to whom is the glory, is the one who arranges the tribulation, then what is requested of us? To receive it. For every tribulation, our first reaction should be to receive the tribulation as something he has done. And so long as he says it must be this way, then I will say, okay. So long as you see it as a must, then I say, okay. To receive it means to say, okay. He is assembling it and we say, okay, we receive it. And when he prays, then we come and do what? We pray so we can meet. The disciples' souls were so greatly troubled because they didn't pray. We didn't hear about them praying at all in this passage. He's, he's praying, but they didn't sense that he was up all night praying. If we continue in prayer all night, the way he, he's continuing in prayer all night, then we'll meet. Him on the mountain, us on the sea. Him in heaven, preparing the kingdom, us in the world, drowning. But prayer does what? It binds us to him and lets us hold his hand. We will never drown. He's in heaven praying and we're on earth drowning. So long as he's praying, we will never drown. The third reaction. As he comes close to us, what should we do? We are to, to come close to him or discover or wait. Call it whatever you want to call it. Meaning what? Look closely. Zoom in and notice that Jesus is so close in the tribulation, but you didn't pay attention. You didn't notice. That's the best time in your life to see Jesus. That's the most likely moment to see his divinity and to know his glory. This is an experience you'll never forget if you tasted it. So you need to discover him. He's close, but the flaw is with us, is in us. During tribulation, he is so close, but it's too much for us, so we close the door on ourselves lest we see him. We just sit there, too distracted by the waves. And when he comes to us, we say, it's a ghost. Fourth thing, when he encourages, what should we be doing? He says to us, don't be afraid. What do we say in response? We say, amen, amin, and not be afraid. Amin meaning we trust. We trust in him that, his, that this tribulation will pass by and be to our benefit in the end. He's telling you, do not be afraid. So try, try to not be afraid. If you received the tribulation and prayed well and looked for Jesus, you will find that you're what? That you're not afraid of tribulation. But this doesn't happen on the first go around. Sometimes when someone is facing tribulation, he's told, don't be afraid. First, tell him to receive, to pray, look for Jesus so that you won't be afraid. But when you tell someone to just not be afraid, he tells you, what are you saying, man? You're telling me to not be afraid. This is what Peter did because he wasn't praying and he wasn't believing that he was that 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 was Jesus there in the tribulation. So telling him, don't be afraid, didn't work for him. It didn't benefit him. Take note. He doubted and told Jesus, if it is you, if it is you, then let me come to you. After that. The other disciples surely grabbed hold of Peter to argue with him and tell him, shouldn't you have told Jesus, if it is you, let the sea become calm? But Peter was in a hurry and told him, command me to come to you. Jesus wants to elevate us above the tribulation. So what are we to, the, to do then? What is the key in simple terms? While we're walking over the tribulation, over the sea, Jesus is telling us don't lower our eyes from him. If you lower your eyes from me, you won't be able to continue. As if we're being promoted from the idea of praying to the idea of praying at all times. Unceasing prayer, which will leave you unable to focus on the world for a single moment. And that moment, when you do focus on the world, you'll get weak, you'll drown. You need to focus on heaven or on Jesus every moment. And this is the blessing of tribulations. This is the greatness of tribulations. Nobody can get to this stage except through tribulation. Nobody can fix their eyes on Jesus except in the moment of danger. But in the normal moments, what were the disciples intending to do? They were intending to go to sleep. 
But here they stayed up late unwillingly. That's why on the night of his betrayal, when Jesus told them to stay up and pray, lest they enter into temptation, they understood it. They were tempted. When they didn't stay up, the sea became boisterous, and they prayed, whether they wanted to or not. So don't lower your eyes from Jesus. Keep them fixed on him. And then, rejoice. Because he lifted the tribulation, the sea became calm, and worship. Isn't that what the disciples did? The joy couldn't be contained. When they found that the sea calmed down, they worshipped and confessed Jesus' divinity. And so our teacher James tells us that since the end of the world, since the end of the whole thing is joy, so he tells us to count it all joy, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. This is the state we need to arrive at. Then James explains to us the progressions in his own way. He says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that is the work of prayer, that you may be perfected and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So he's giving us the solutions. He tells us there's patience, there's prayer, there's a request for wisdom, and there's humility. And our teacher James gives us the progressions in a completely different way, but the end of it all is the same result, which is that we must rejoice. He says again that you must rejoice. That's in the end. But in the beginning, you have the expectation that you will rejoice, knowing the end of the tribulation is good. The test of faith will produce patience. Let patience have its perfect work. If you want wisdom, then pray and ask for wisdom. So there's praying. Wisdom, be patient, and humility. Remain humble. Patience, prayer, wisdom, humility. Those do what? They will give you all the blessings of tribulations. You'll notice our teacher Paul has another way of putting it in the book of Romans chapter 5. He says, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. He's going, he's going to the glory in the tribulations because he's going to arrive at the same conclusion as James. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. This matches what James said. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts. Meaning, it's impossible for you to drown. Hope does not disappoint. It won't happen. As long as you're waiting for God to intervene, he will never disappoint you. Ever. If tribulation is a cross of temptation, it is indeed a cross. Why? Due to the extent of physical and psychological pain that they went through, is it was super difficult. Nobody can, other, no, nobody can say otherwise. So come now, let's ask the disciples. Imagine that we have the disciples here with us right now. And let's ask them a question or two. If Jesus came to you one day before all this and, and gave you the following options and saying, after we do the miracle of the five loaves, would you like me to run you through this ex excruciating tribulation or should we just forget it and go to sleep? Remember, we're asking this question after it's all over. They've gone to heaven now. What would Peter say, specifically Peter? He'd say, that was the first time and the last time that I walked on the sea. It's a must. I wouldn't choose it over anything else. Once I asked a guy that question, he had gone through an extremely grueling tribulation, and I wasn't sure how he'd end up after it was all said and done. Ten years passed by, and I met him again and asked him, How are you doing? He told me the following. If God gave me the choice of going through those hard times or not, I'd tell, I'd tell God, You have to make me go through them. Because I saw him during those times. I never could have seen him without them. Peter, if we ask him, Would you like to walk on the sea? With the waves taking you up and down and your eyes fixed on Jesus' eyes, tasting things you'll never taste again. But the catch is tribulation, an agonizing evening, anxiety, pain. Would you accept it or not? He would accept it. He has to. Because this is what made Peter, Peter, Peter the apostle, and made him to know that every tribulation on the sea will calm down in the end. Father Tadros Ya'ub Melati 
says that either way, the sea is going to calm down, regardless. But how many people walked on the sea during the tribulation? Do you get it? Tribulation is going to pass by us, and no matter what, it'll finish. Either it will finish us, or it will be finished. But either way, it will finish. However, not everyone experiences walking on the sea during tribulation. Is it clear? The person who enters into conflict with Jesus in prayer and faith, fixing his eyes on Jesus' eyes, that's the person who tastes the beauty of tribulation and its blessings. And in any case, it will calm down. The waves will cease. But if you have a huge reserve and tell God, Lord, that cross of tribulation is what lifted me. Don't lift the tribulation. Lift me above the tribulation. That's the best request one can make in tribulation. Whether to lift the tribulation or leave it, that ball is in your court, Lord. I don't understand anything. You are the one who understands. How unsearchable are, the, are his judgments and his ways past finding out? However, I have just one request. Let me rise above the tribulation as you want me to be. Let me not be anxious. Let me not get weak. Let me not cry out for fear because I'm ashamed. Sometimes you tell me, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Because you don't like it when I cry out for fear. And glory be to God forever. Amen.